I'm Mr. Richmond. This is your Integrated Math 2, Unit 12.3 Lesson Summary. In 12.3, we're going to start to look at the graphs of quadratic functions uh, when they're in standard form. Talk about um, how we can take vertical motion in the real world and turn it into a quadratic function. Um, and then talk about how to identify the domain and range of functions, how to use proper notation for that, which will be interval notation. And uh, we'll go from there. So let's start with what interval notation is. Um, well, first of all, an interval is the set of real numbers between any two given numbers. Interval notation is a way of representing that. So for example, if I had an inequality, I could have the numbers between negative 3 and 2, if you can imagine that on some shading. OK, so I'm now trying to talk about the numbers between negative 3 and 2. I can represent that in interval notation. And now there's different types of intervals. There's open, which is the set of all numbers between A and B, but not including it. So if you don't want it to actually include it, which when you did inequalities would mean these are open dots. In other words, it goes right to those numbers, but doesn't actually touch them. Um, when we write that in interval notation, just to give you an example, uh, we use parentheses when it doesn't actually touch the number, it goes as close to it, but doesn't include it. And the way we write things in interval notation is we put our farthest left term, our number value, and our farthest right. So what two numbers is it in between? Well, this one would be in between negative 3 and 2, not including them. So it would look like that when I write it in interval notation. That's the range of numbers uh, we're using. There's also half closed or half open. That's the set of all numbers between A and B, including A, but not B. That would look like this. So if it is including the number, we use a bracket instead of a parentheses. So this would include A, but not include B. Or not include A, but include B, in that case in reverse. So taking my same example, I'll kind of show you that. So I'm going to just continue to use that same one to help explain it a little better. Um, if it's including the first number, then that would now be colored in. That means we actually can be equal to negative 3 as well, but we just can't go to the left of that. So that would look like this. Negative, oops, let me draw that again. Negative 3, comma 2 with a parenthesis because we start at negative 3 and include it, bracket, and we go through to 2, open, and do not include it. Now, same graph. I'm going to change it to model this. Now, I don't include negative 3, but I do include 2. Don't include negative 3, so open. But I do go all the way through to 2 and include it, so bracket. You need to be able to move between these two forms. Look at a graph and know how to put interval notation and also how to interpret interval notation and go back to a graph or know what numbers it's talking about. Okay? We can also have closed intervals. That's the set of all numbers between A and B and includes them. That would be if both of yours are closed. And anytime it's colored in, including it, closed, etc., it uses brackets. So you can have both sides be brackets. Okay? So hopefully that helps there. Now, one thing that we're going to start to see is graphs and things that go on forever. And the number or symbol we use for forever, the idea of forever, is infinity. Infinite. It's kind of like an upside down or horizontal eight. Um, here's the issue with infinity. Let's say I wanted all numbers. Okay. Do this on a number line again, um, greater than or equal to 2. And they go on, though, forever. Well, my starting number is 2 and includes it, but it goes up forever. So I, the only way I can represent that is with infinity. But here's the tricky thing with infinity. Because it goes on forever, you can never actually be exactly infinity or equal to that. So infinities always have to have parentheses. Always have to have parentheses. On the flip side, and I know I'm kind of all over the place here, but uh, hopefully you can follow me. Um, let's say I was open on three, just to make it a little bit different, and going left forever. Well, now I'm going towards negative numbers, negative 100,000, negative 100 million. The farthest left I'm going is negative infinity, which again, I can't touch. So I start at negative infinity this time, and I work my way right to three, and this time three is open, so it could be parentheses. So the, what I'm trying to get at here is the infinity symbols, if you use those in an interval notation, should never have brackets. Infinities always have parentheses. Okay, and in your homework, you'll practice quite a few of those. I'm sure your teacher will go over that a little bit more in detail. Um, and I'll show you how to do with domain and range. But hopefully that's enough to get you through. 
Okay, now for the quadratic things we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at zeros. Zeros are just yet another word for x-intercepts. We can also be known as roots. The x-intercepts of a graph of a function is what a zero is. It's where the graph crosses the x-axis. So if I had a parabola coming down through here and I actually graphed that, whether I graphed it by my, myself um, or using a graphing calculator, the x-intercepts or the roots will always be where it goes through the x-axis. And you can trace those or you can use the, the x-intercept function on your calculator to find them. Okay? Big thing to know about x-intercepts, they always occur when y is zero. So one of the best techniques you have algebraically to find um, zeros or roots is to set it equal to zero, and that's something we're going to do in the next, uh, next unit. Okay? Now, vertical motion. What's a vertical motion model? Let's see if I can do this without breaking my pen today. Vertical motion model is a quadratic equation that models the height of an object given time. So here's an object, okay? I'm going to let it leave my hand from some certain height. If I go from here, it's starting at a higher height than here. So in this equation, h of t represents the height of the object over time. The equation that models it is negative 16 t squared, where t is time, it's in the air, plus v sub 0. That means the initial velocity, so it's the speed at which it leaves your hand. Okay, plus h of zero, which is your starting height. And this will always kind of roughly work for how an object moves. So let me give you an example. h of zero would be, I don't know, three feet if I did it here. Four feet, five feet, you know, six feet. So that's just where I start. So that's always a constant number. h of zero would go there. Negative 16 t squared is basically gravity. It's the effect of gravity. Everyone knows if I just let go of this, it drops. What's the pace it drops at? Negative 16 t squared. Every second, it actually drops a little faster. It speeds up as it goes down until it hits max velocity. So that's why we use this equation, negative 16 t squared, for that. The v of zero is going to fight against that. That's why it's positive, because if I uh, fire it up with some sort of initial velocity, I'm counteracting that for a little bit. But as we know, it won't counteract it forever. So initial height, three feet. Initial velocity, how fast it's moving and drop. So my plus 20t, if I'm doing it at 20 feet per second up in the air, is going to fight it up for a little while, but then eventually as that negative 16t squared starts to operate on it, it's going to slow it down and bring it down. And if you watch my pin, it goes fast at first, slows, holds for a second, and comes down. And that's because of the effect of gravity having to slow down the initial velocity and then starting to speed it back down, which is why this equation is always a parabola because if you think about how it's moving it's speeding up speeding up slowing down slowing down as time passes it makes a, a parabolic shape okay so i'm going to show you how to plug things into that based on word problems and create an equation out so let's try that right now so as a baseball is thrown into the air from an initial height of five feet so that's my starting point five feet is how high i threw it from i mean it doesn't matter how i throw it in these problems all that matters is that initial velocity a lot of students get it mixed up. They see this parabola and they think that's like distance it's gone. Like I threw it in a parabolic shape. None of that matters. This is just time. What is the height of the ball as time is passing? So you've got to be more aware of the fact of what your x-axis is. Okay? And it has an initial velocity of 15 feet per second. So the height of the ball over time always equals negative 16 t squared because that's gravity affecting that ball but my speed 15 per second is the speed i'm throwing it at that's going to fight against the um, gravity of the ball plus i did start at an initial height of five so it's just a matter of plugging it in to this equation you always have negative 16 t squared you plug in the speed it's thrown at in front of t and then you end with just the height you start at and so that would be my function now that I know that, I'm going to graph it. Now, we don't expect you to be able to graph these kind of tougher ones quite yet. Um, we'll get into that. So we're just going to use our calculator today. So I'm going to type this function in. I'm going to press y equals, type in negative 16. Now, I don't have a t, so I'm going to use x. x is fine. Negative 16x squared plus 15x plus 5. And I'm going to hit graph. And I can see my function. Now, I'm going to show you what it looks like at first. This is just the standard viewing window of what it looks like. And you can see it's okay, but it's kind of hard to, you know, to see the full thing. My scale's really big. So I'm gonna adjust it. Um, I'm gonna go to my window, 
And it looks like I don't need the negatives to go as far, so I'm only going to go to negative 4, just like my coordinate plane here is. And I'm going to make my x max 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, maybe 8. And my y min, I'm only going to go down to negative 3 or so. And my y max did go up quite a bit, so I'll go up to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We'll keep it at 10. Hit graph. And you can see how it just affects my viewing window slightly. And so I can see some different things. Um, I can see where it's going through the x-axis roughly, and I can see um, the vertex. And you can still use this trace function to, to follow it and get some values. And so if you're not sure what something is, you can trace and get an idea. Okay? And some teachers might show you how to specifically find the x-intercepts and the zeros. Actually, you know what? I'll do that too. How to do that with a calculator. Um, but most of the problems for your test will be a little bit more reasonable numbers and it won't be as necessary to do that. But we wanted to use a not so perfect example here to begin. So let's graph it first. It looks like it's going through, and I'm going to calculate the zero, and try to do that. So I'm on trace, I'm looking at it. It looks like it's between these two kind of numbers on the left side. So I'm going to do second calc, and I'm going to choose zero. And that does exactly what it says, find the zero. Um, but it's going to say left bound, which means I need to be underneath or to the left of the x-intercept. And so you can see me kind of moving my star. Here's below it. Here's above it. And press enter there and I can guess it. So my first zero is approximately negative 0.26 comma zero. So I know I'm in the right spot. Negative 0.26 comma zero. So that would be roughly there. Now that only gives me one of them. So if I want to get the other zero, I've got to repeat the process. Second calc, zero and left bound. So I need to go to just to the left of the other zero. So I just keep moving. Now I'm below it. So I want to be above it. Press enter. Now I want to right bound. So I make sure I'm below it. I press enter. And then enter a third time to guess. And this one, see how it says 1e to the negative 12? That means 1 times 10 to the negative 12. That's as close to zero pretty much as you can get here. So that's fine. And it looks like 1.19. So I'm going to round to 1.2. So again, these aren't perfect. Um, and that's kind of okay here for this first one. Um, it lets you see that numbers cannot work out perfect sometimes, but still gives us an idea of what the graph should look like. Okay? And now I have my zeros. The other thing I want to find is my vertex, the very top of this parabola. I'll show you how to find that if you're using a graphing calculator. So I again do second calc and I look for maximum because this one has a highest point so I have to use mi uh, maximum to find it same thing as I showed in the last video I want to go left bound so that's left of it press enter right bound that's right of that vertex press enter enter one more time and it gives me an approximate approximate maximum 0.47 and 8.5 0.47 and 8.5 so 0.47 0.5. Okay, and that gives me roughly my parabola. Okay, so I've got the zeros. I was a little tougher for this. Again, on the um, tests and things like that, we're going to make these much easier to find, and we're going to show you some algebraic ways. Right now, we're just trying to show you how to find them graphically by looking at them. Domain and range, and I want to represent these in interval notation. Domain is the x values used in my graph. Now, this one's really steep, so it might be tough to see, but I still have an arrow, and this is still slanting slightly out forever to the left and slightly out forever to the right. So the farthest left this thing ever goes is negative infinity. The farthest right it ever goes is positive infinity. And this is what your domain for a normal quadratic function always is. It's negative infinity to infinity. You can plug anything you want in for x and get an answer. So your domain should always be this. The range is what? Is, can be limited. Because it's going down, right, and I got to think, even though this is going up and down, I still have to think kind of like left to right. And so sometimes this helps when I show students this.
Just think of your number line as being up and down instead. What's the lowest you go? Well, it's going forever. So it's shaded forever downwards and goes up until it touches the maximum value. Um, maximum value, I think we said was 8.5. Let me check back. Yeah, 8.5 was where we hit right here. So that's the highest it would ever go. And so students have a hard time doing the interval notation for range sometimes. So the way I say it is just think of it from left to right. This is going left forever and right forever, so it's all real numbers this direction, negative infinity to infinity, but up and down it's going down forever, so negative infinity to 8.5. Negative infinity to 8.5 and touches it, so it gets a bracket because it does actually touch a highest point and then it comes back down forever. So make sure you practice. Domain and range is really big here um, in the algebra chapter. Okay, intervals of increase. This is actually a math one topic you did. Where is this graph increasing? Well, it starts low and it continues to increase until it hits that vertex. So the intervals of increase are from negative infinity to, and it stops basically at that vertex of um, 8.5, but for the x values, that would be 0.47. So it continues to increase until 0.47. Then it begins to decrease from 0.47 to infinity. Okay, so now it's just dividing my graph into an increasing part and a decreasing part in terms of the domain. Okay, and then I added two more here at the bottom um, that I thought were important. It says, what's the domain of the problem and the range of the problem? Well, this is the domain and range of the actual equation in the graph, but this is the math side of it. And this is why human beings are still necessary. A lot of kids, my kids go, why don't we just have the computer do it? Why don't we have the computer do it? Why don't we just have the calculator do it? Because the calculator only understands the language of math, and math is created by us, and therefore is not truly what's happening in the situation of the reality. It's a, its own language. So this equation doesn't know that this is doing with a baseball, with a real human being on ground. So if I thought about this problem in actuality of what it really is, okay, this is time. So zero, zero is always like the starting moment of my time. And my time's increasing this way. This is the height of the baseball. So zero would be the height of the ball being on ground. So none of this makes any sense. From here, the ball is now going through the ground. That's not going to happen. The ball stopped right there. So my equation doesn't know that, so it's going to continue doing the quadratic forever, but in actuality, it's going to stop right there. And on this side, one second, a little past one second, over here, this is back in time. So now I've gone back in time to see what happened to this ball as it fell out of my hands or something. It just doesn't make sense. Your time has to start at zero, and your height with stuff like this has to stop at zero. So all this extra graph I did is not actually necessary in terms of the real problem. And that's what they kind of want you to be able to see here. All right, so I kind of have to think a little bit more accurately. So what's the domain of the problem? Well, the problem actually starts at time of zero and stops at exactly this point here. That's when time would no longer matter because it hit the ground. What does that occur? 1.2 seconds, and it does actually touch that. So that's the true domain of the problem. The range of the problem, well, the lowest this ball ever went is zero. It's never going to go below zero. It does touch zero, so really the range of the problem starts at zero and goes to whatever the highest point I ever reached. The highest point I ever uh, reached was at the vertex of 8.5. And so it's really good to know what you actually need in terms of the problem you talk about. I can't go back in time, so my domain can't be negative, and I can't go below the ground with this baseball, so that doesn't make sense, so my range shouldn't go below zero. So you want to be able to think of your domain range in terms of the actual equation which is fine here, and in terms of the actual problem. So um, this will be a chapter you'll mainly do on the graphing calculator to kind of practice and get set up, but uh, it's real important for understanding what these quadratics really are and what they're actually really representing. Um, to me, that really is the most important part. Uh, then we'll get into the, the idea of graphing it correctly and et cetera by hand. But for now, just make sure you get an idea of what this thing's really doing and what this means. So thank you and good luck.